Today, Biden pressures Israel as the Gaza ceasefire stalemate continues. Walls rallies the DNC ahead of Harris's big speech, while Trump attacks on immigration and jobs. A shutdown of Canada's rail network threatens US supply chains. And the financial elite gather in Jackson Hole, with all eyes on Fed Chair Jerome Powell and where interest rates could be heading. It's Thursday, August 22nd. This is Reuters World News, bringing you everything you need to know from the front lines in 10 minutes every weekday. I'm Tara Oakes in Liverpool. A Palestinian woman rushing into hospital with her children after an Israeli strike on a school and house in Gaza City on Wednesday. The airstrike was one of a number which Palestinian officials said killed 50 in a 24-hour period. Today, Israeli forces have pressed deeper into areas of the central and southern Gaza Strip. This latest escalation came hours after President Joe Biden pressed Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on the urgency of sealing a deal for a truce and the release of hostages. Vice President Kamala Harris also took part in the call with Netanyahu, while her VP pick, Tim Walz, took to the stage at the DNC. Christopher Wall-Jasper was there. Well, thank you. Now, from the moment Walls stepped on stage, he really leaned into this Midwestern folksiness that he's become known for, as well as his career as a high school football coach. It's the fourth quarter. We're down a field goal, but we're on offense and we've got the ball. We're Throughout the speech, Walls painted a picture of himself that really bucked stereotypes. He opened up about his family's struggles with infertility. And I can remember praying each night for a phone call. The pit in your stomach when the phone had rang and the absolute agony when we heard the treatments hadn't worked. He spoke about his time as a teacher, but also highlighted his skills as a hunter and a marksman, but one who also believes in gun control. Now, Walls also got into some policy promises. Things like affordable housing and promising to protect reproductive rights. But he avoided some of the more contentious issues, uh, like immigration and the southern border, as well as the conflict in Gaza, which has been at the center of protests outside the convention all week. Harris's record on immigration was front and center at a rally for Donald Trump and his running mate, J.D. Vance, in North Carolina. The outdoor rally was Trump's first since last month's assassination attempt. He spoke from a podium that was surrounded by bulletproof glass and guarded by snipers while questioning the validity of recent jobs data. The new data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that the Administration padded the numbers with an extra, listen to this one, 818,000 jobs that don't exist. While Trump plans to visit the Arizona-Mexico border today, Harris will officially accept the nomination for president tonight as the headline event of the DNC. I caught up with our White House reporter, Trevor Honeycutt, to learn a little bit more about what we might expect from Harris's speech. Well, you know, even though Kamala Harris has been in the public eye now for several years as the vice president, she and her team really don't think that she's that well known among the American public. And so what you're going to see in her speech tonight is an introduction of sorts. She's going to talk about her upbringing, her background. She's going to try to define those things in positive terms. And she's going to try to connect that to a message of unity, which she's then is going to contrast with what she will say is the division that's coming coming from the Republican ticket. Now, one criticism I've heard all week is that the party really hasn't come out with a strong enough stance on the situation in Gaza. Do we expect Harris to address that at all in her speech tonight? I think Harris is gonna address a lot of key issues, including Gaza, in broad strokes. 
and that's kind of the key right now, is not being tied down to specifics that are going to alienate people. The Democrats are trying to project the idea that they are a big tent, that this is a party that's open to Republicans who don't like Donald Trump, and it's open to far-left progressives as well. You will see that issue mentioned. I think you'll see a lot of other issues that divide Democrats mentioned, again, in broad terms. Immigration could be an example of that. Abortion could be an example of that. But the idea will be to paint those in as unifying a way as possible. In Canada, the country's two biggest freight rail operators have shut down their networks in an unprecedented simultaneous work stoppage. The dispute could badly damage the Canadian economy and have a significant effect on cross-border trade with the United States. 10,000 workers are locked out after unions and the companies failed to agree contract terms. David Youngren in Ottawa is covering the story. Canada is the world's second largest country by territory. It's huge. And pretty much anything that anyone makes or digs or pulls out of the ground is transported at some point by train. So you have grain, you have potash, you have automobiles, you have coal, you have some oil, you name it. It has to move by rail in Canada. So stoppage by both companies for the first time ever has a lot of, a lot of industry worried. Will the effect of this be seen in stores? The impact is not going to be immediate in the sense of there being empty shelves tomorrow. But pretty quickly, people are going to start seeing less fruit, less vegetables, especially the main grain growing areas out west. You're going to start seeing the grain being held up in hoppers and therefore not getting to market, not getting to ports. Also, some of the people who go on strike are responsible for the commuter trains in Toronto, which is by far Canada's largest city. So the hundreds of thousands of people who rely on trains to get in and out of Toronto are immediately going to be stuck. Independent U.S. presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wants a deal with Donald Trump. A super PAC supporting Kennedy has told Reuters he would endorse the Republican rival in exchange for a job in a potential Trump administration. Kennedy is set to address the nation on Friday in Arizona, where he will talk about the present historical moment and his path forward. The body of British tech magnate Mike Lynch has been retrieved from the wreck of his family yacht that sank earlier this week off the coast of Sicily, a source close to the rescue operation has said. Lynch was one of the UK's best-known tech entrepreneurs and had invited friends to join him on the yacht to celebrate his recent acquittal in a major US fraud trial. Influencer Andrew Tate and his brother Tristan as they were detained by Romanian authorities. Police searched their properties as part of an investigation into crimes including human trafficking and sex with a minor. The Tates were already indicted in mid-2023 for human trafficking, rape and forming a criminal gang to sexually exploit women, allegations they denied. Central bankers from around the world are gathering in Jackson Hole, Wyoming for their annual get-together. Fed Chair Jerome Powell's speech on Friday is the main event. Howard Schneider covers the U.S. Central Bank for us and is at the Mountain Resort Lodge. So, Howard, what is Powell expected to say? They are gearing towards an initial rate cut in September after having uh, raised interest rates to the highest level in a quarter century to to stamp out inflation that really was uh, akin to what people saw in the 70s and 80s. So this is a big moment for them. Now, they've kind of let the cat out of the bag a little bit. At the last meeting, they hinted this was coming. In the minutes of that meeting, they sort of nailed that down with a vast majority of policymakers saying that if the data keeps showing lower inflation, they're ready to start lowering interest rates, and that's all happened. What Powell can do tomorrow is sort of put some color around that, some texture on it, and I think more importantly, should he choose to do so, start to talk about how the rate path is going to unfold from here, what they're going to be looking for, the pace they might go at, the risks they face. What sort of tone is Powell likely to adopt? I'm expecting a very measured speech. Listen, he is not 
come out and hang a mission accomplished sign on the battleship <laughs> that is Jackson Hole, right? He doesn't want to say mission accomplished. They have been sideswiped, sucker punched so many times about inflation and data and revisions. You know, they just found out today, for example, that there were probably 800,000 fewer jobs than they thought after all the benchmarks were revised. So they've seen this story before. They don't want to get it wrong. So he's going to keep his options open. But I would expect him to start framing what the debate's going to look like, the parameters around the discussion going forward. A touching recommended read from us today before we go. It's all about the death of one half of Australia's famous gay penguin duo and how his surviving partner is coping. You can find a link in today's description. To hear more about any of the stories from today's episode, head to Reuters.com or the Reuters app. We'll be back tomorrow with our daily headline show. And to never miss an episode, subscribe on your favourite podcast player. Listener.